Um, I want to do talk about what we're going to see today in Field Trip Friday. So here's my video. And we are going to go to Death Valley, which is in California, very close to the, the border with Nevada. And we have two guest hosts today. We have Jim Rutkowski, who's a doctoral student at the University of Texas, El Paso. He's on the call today, and he lives very close to Death Valley. He lives in Pahrump, Nevada, which we'll see on a map, which is he can see his field area. It, it, it's only, uh, whatever, 10 minutes away for him. And he's only about 25 minutes away from Death Valley. So he has a great uh, field trip plate to show you. And then we're going to have another commentator, Megan Thibodeau, volunteered to be on our program. She is a member of HGS, and she saw the topic of Death Valley, and she volunteered to come on and talk about she was with the Park Service in 2012 uh, as, uh, while she was a student. And she uh, experienced Death Valley for almost, uh, whatever, six or seven months. And she'll mm -hmm. tell you about the summer temperatures and what it was like to be in Death Valley and her research, which was more groundwater related, where Jim's research is structural and uh, tectonic related. Mm -hmm. Death Valley days. Hey, who remembers this TV show? <laughs> I do. If you remember this TV show, you were born in the 60s. So I Death Valley Day was a popular TV show. And I did see some recordings you can see on YouTube, and they never are in Death Valley in any of any of the shows. There is, it's all a set show, but they have this great opening sequence. Uh, Death Valley is, like I said, on the border of California and Nevada. And this little square shows these um, basins, which we'll learn about in more detail that form the topography of Death Valley. And Charles and I visited for the first time Death Valley in 2018, and we were very excited to enter California. So thanks to Google Earth Pro, we're gonna take a little bit of a flyover of what Death Valley looks like. And if you have not seen Google Earth Pro, you need to check this out, seriously. I mean, Google Earth is pretty cool, but Google Earth Pro has a lot more uh, detail. So the park service is at Furnace Creek up there. And as we pull back here, you get to see that there is a hotel that is, you know, available to stay at, at Furnace Creek. And it's called the Inn at, o I think it's the Oasis Inn. But as we pull out, you see how desolate it is when you go into Death Valley. We're going to take a look at these mountains and visit Zabrinsky Point during the video. And as it pulls out even further, you can see a complicated geology there in the, in the hills. It's a mixture of uh, Mesozoic and Precambrian and uh, volcanics. And so this big wide view pulls out here. And you see we're going to go to a place called Badwater Basin, which is a Park Service uh, public stop that Megan's very familiar with. And uh, take a look at, as you walk out, these are all evaporates out here, modern evaporates. Mm -hmm. And I think now the video zooms out one more time. And this is a cool feature of Google Earth Pro. Okay, it's not rivers that put on there. It's these are like where the roads are. For some reason, they've made all the roads blue. Looks like rivers. But that just shows you that these are your roads that you're able to get into the valley on. And then we have this cool 3D view here. So having said that, we're going to switch over to Jim. Let me get out of here. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, yeah, I'm a non-traditional student. Um, I started college at 33, and it was interrupted by little things like bankruptcy and Hurricane Katrina. So that's why I'm still doing it at 54, but I'm on my last year. I've always had a love of structure and tectonics, and I've been pretty good at being able to visualize in my head um, what's happening in the subsurface, which made me a very successful um Geologist. Uh, basically, I love field mapping. I love structure and tectonics. I love this area. I knew in 2000 that I was going to be moving out here, and I finally did it. So, um, and I met Charles and Linda through yeah. uh, me. That's a picture of me right there being at the uh, general chair of the AAPG 
Southwest Section Convention in El Paso, which we were very proud to put on as the El Paso Geologic Society. And I want to give some shouts out to Gail Arnold, to Ben Brunner, and to Claire Bailey for all of their help with that. Well, now, how's your thesis going? Is there a, a when do you think you're going to finish your thesis? Uh, September. Oh. Congratulations. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Ooh. All right, well, Megan, can you <laughs> Megan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I currently am a environmental protection specialist. So more or less, I'm on the protection of the geological side and the environment. I also um, I have a consulting company based out of Houston, and we're environmental consultants, and we focus on hazardous waste, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. But I started as a hydrogeologist. Um, I went to Texas A&M and did hydrogeology and ocean and coastal resources to focus on offshore exploration. But that was about the time that BP had their little mishap. So I decided to go into just my <laughs> love for geology. <laughs> and so I'm a third generation geologist and I actually got this opportunity um, to work in the Park Service through the Geological Society of America. Um, so they do have a program for um, postdocs as well as um, master students. And I was chosen to go out to Death Valley. And so that's, it was the start of my geological career and just got me to love everything. And working as a hydrogeologist in the middle of a desert is something that is so unique and it's definitely brought me to where I am today. So it's, everything is all falls into place and it's all connected. So a little bit about me. Okay, so this is going to be very multimedia today. We have lots of animations and we have lots of video. So we're going to start off with Jim is, has a PowerPoint to show that has embedded drone video. And then we're going to talk, Charles will be virtually talking in Death Valley and Megan will come in and talk about the Park Service. So I want to get that started because we're at 11.05. We have 53 people here on the call. So, okay, Jim. I will advance the slides. Just say next, and I'll advance them. Okay, dokie. So this is Southern Death Valley. Um, I'm way more familiar with Southern Death Valley than the northern part, basically because if you go north, it's like a three to five hour drive to get to some places. So I, I kind of stay closer to home. Um, this is a location map of Death Valley. Um, it's it always shows up in Nevada and. Death Valley is actually just that little corner by Lyle Lake, um, but it's mostly California. Uh, and it's a very accessible, easily accessible place uh, that you would easily want to visit if it's not summer. Next slide. Oh, I threw this in on you because I just, this is the super big picture. Yeah, and I'm not going to go into too much of this because I could sit and talk and talk and talk, but um, this is a, a kind of a cartoon that um, of the deformation and what was happening in the past that created these this basin and range type stuff. In fact, an interesting aside is basin and range was coined out here um, in Death Valley. That was the first place that was used. So um, we can come back with questions on this, but I'd rather just get the content. This is a quick down and dirty cartoon of the stratigraphic units. We have everything from um, basement rocks that can be up to Archean in age, all the way up through the Pennsylvania Permian. Um, for the most part, the Death Valley that I work in uh, it starts at the Johnny Formation um, and then goes all the way up through the rest of the column. So again, I just included this so you can see the rocks. It's mainly, we're looking at limestones and dolomites. For the most part, some isolated quartzite beds. And of course, there's volcanics and everything else that's younger that went through there. But it's a basic sketch of what's going on. Next slide. Oh, I threw in a quick geology map because uh, here people see Bakersfield and the right. faulting and a big transverse fault, the Garlock fault. And the then your field yeah. area is sort of over here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's there's a lot of there's been a lot of tectonic forces that have that have gone to creating the pull apart basin that uh, Death Valley is. It's transtensional. It's not a traditional pull apart basin, but yeah, this is a good map. Um, do you have, do you have, have studied this Garlock fault? Does that cross into your field area? 
it does it does matter it, it peters out just before it but um my advisor's wife dr laura serpa has done extensive work on the garlock fault and you could query her for more details if you need it, that on that next slide okay so i the orange stars are places that i'm going to be talking about there's the one in bad at badwater in the middle and then the two on the side, the top one is Ash Meadows Nature Preserve, and then the bottom one is China Ranch. And what I wanted to discuss, and it's great that we got a hydrogeologist on, is um, when you read the history of Death Valley, many, the, many people died of thirst. And the Indians, the Native Americans here, the Tambisha Shoshone, were always wondering why so many people were dying because there's so much water. And there is a lot of water in Death Valley. There's also lots of places that don't have a lot of water, but I'm going to show you some that have them. Next slide. Oops, down, oops, down, there you go. Okay, um, this is a geologist outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's heard that, yes. Here we get so already heard. All right, next slide. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> this is Badwater Basin. This is one of my favorite pictures of Badwater. It really shows you though that there's a lot of water there and it, it's seasonal and it fluctuates. Sometimes it floods. One time I saw people kite surfing on it, um, which was really interesting to see. Uh, next slide. This is China Ranch Date Farm. This is just outside of Death Valley, closer to Shoshone and Tacopa on the southern end. This is a true oasis. Um, it's got an interesting history too. It was owned by a man from China who ranched it in the early 1900s. And then the white folk in the area wanted the land and all of a sudden the Chinese farmer disappeared and uh, it became China Ranch Date Farm at as kind of a, an homage to him. Next slide. And so does this get enough natural rain to support these dates? Oh, yeah. Um, this is actually, it's called Willow Creek. It's actually a, a branch of the Amargosa River. This is the place that has free-flowing above-ground water 365 days a year, typically. So it has a lot of water, and there's a little stream running through it. It's a beautiful place. And if you ever get a chance, I'm going to come back. You'll see other China Ranch ones. You'll... Uh, you should visit this, um, and the dates are delicious. Next slide. This is Ash Meadows Nature Preserve, a pupfish habitat. The pupfish is an interesting evolutionary experiment. Um, when there was a lot more water and everything was interconnect interconnected, there was one species of pupfish. But the water's dried up, and it left little isolated patches of pupfish, so now they are protected, and they only live in that environment. There's one out by Saratoga Springs, there's the Ash Meadows, there's the Devil's Hole, there's the Shoshone pupfish, which just was brought back from the brink of extinction and is now off of the endangered list. Next slide. And that's another thing for Ash Meadows. That's the reservoir. That is a lot of water. What, so time, of year, water table, what time of year does the water come in? It's, it's year-round. The year water round. table, that's, that's basically just the water table right there. Oops. Okay. Jim, right there, is that where the sand is so hot it boils up right there in Ash Meadows? Yes. 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 Okay, next slide. This is Shoshone. Um, it's a beautiful little town owned by uh, Susan Sorrells uh, that has a research center in it. First of all, Shoshone's got a lot of history and it's well worth going to. Um, but if you go to the next slide, Linda, there you go. Um, that's where the location is. And then next slide. This is the Shear Center, the Shoshone Education and Research Center. This is administrated by my advisor and his wife and uh, Daryl Collin and Marley Miller um, and John Kasky from San Francisco. It's a research center. It will house maybe 30 people over different Quonset huts and it's this trailer. And groups from all over the world come on here, geologic groups, bringing students or doing research. Biologists use it to do vole research out here. Next picture. And this is the inside. It's fully capable of handling 30 people. I, I, I say this to you because it's if it's open, you can rent it out. And it's a great place to stay, and it's a great place to be based out of in Southern Death Valley. So... 
Um, and I can be reached for more information on that. This is a picture of Zabriskie Point that's a little wider than the one that I saw of Charles. Uh, for a while, I was greatly into making panoramics. Um, it took a long time for me to get only one person in that. I had a week for that picture. But this is Badlands topography. It's, it's basically just erosion that's cutting down through these ash um, and clay level or clay uh, layers. Next slide. This is a natural bridge. Um, it's, it is what it is. It's a hole in the, the sediments. Um, you can walk up to it. It's cool to see. Um, it's way bigger than you think it is. If you look, there's little tiny people down there. Um, but it's one of the side trips you can do in Death Valley. Next photo. And everybody, everybody's got a picture of Artist Drive and Artist Palette. Um, mm -hmm. This is a panoramic one that I like. Um, the the ash flows and the tufts that make this up, the different chemical compounds and the salts create these different colors. Um, and it's really, it's purples and oranges, browns, blue, green, turquoise. It's beautiful. And the drive itself is like a roller coaster. It's like a five mile drive up into the mountains. That's which it's just fun all around from beginning to end. Next slide. Well, we've got video and Megan's going to talk about that uh, artist palette too. So okay. now we're down here, right? Yes. Next slide. <laughs> just outside. This is back to China Ranch Date Farm. This is called the Palisades. These are, um, they're, they're definitely uh, quaternary to tertiary sediments. They're mostly quaternary. Um, it's, Based by the the Amazon, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. The Amargosa River um, cut through all of this and uh, created these beautiful cliffs that are called the Palisades. Next slide. And this is part of China Ranch too. The first slide you see on the left hand, <laughs> if you look, you can see a diagonal slice that goes through it. That's the old Tonopah and Tidewater Tonopah and Tidewater Railway that ran from. Um, basically I-15 up to Tonopah, and uh, it operated from the 19, the mid-1900s to 1940, uh, where it was torn up and then the steel was used for battleships. And then the other thing is that vehicle, I don't know what it is and I don't know how old it is, but that person got it stuck and it never moved. So it's, there's a lot of the hyper-arid climate preserves all of this so well for us that you can see the past in the present. Next picture. Well, there's no skeleton in here, is there? I mean, <laughs> I, I have not looked. <laughs> there are so lots of abandoned cars like that, mm. like circa yeah. 1940s, 1950. Right. They're littered across there. Mm. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, next slide. And this is Channel Ranch Day Farm. I call this the tree of life. It's the only tree that sticks up above the brush um, where the river flows through. It's just beautiful. And then you can see part of the cliffs in the background. And those are all full of gypsum. Um, China Ranch is also a gypsum mine, but they've closed them up because they're collapsing. The whole hillsides are just full of large, like, foot-big pieces of gypsum crystal. So it's another fun thing for geologists to do. Next slide. Drones. I do most of my work with drones now. Um, I do photogrammetry, which is taking a series of two-dimensional photos um, that you take normally with the camera and processing it through a program which will create a true 3D model. And we'll take you through some of that. This is me and my um, my buddy, Zach, who just got his PhD. And then Rex is the black dog and Winx is the other one. Um, we, we're always very dog friendly when we do our research. So next slide. This is me operating the drone up by the Gersley mine and then a picture of my drone in the air. It's a 3DR solo, they're discontinued, but they're cheap. Um, it has a GoPro mounted on it and I take video at 25 frames per second in 4K instead of taking pictures so I can pull individual frames out and then use that to process. Next slide. So this is where the star is. This is gonna be our next location. It's called Benny's Road Cut. Benny Troxel, um, next slide. Benny Troxel was a uh, uh, very famous geologist out of here. Him and Lauren Wright published hundreds of papers and mentored hundreds of people um, in their, their uh, quest to create geologists. And this is the Shoshone Volcanics. That's an obsidian seam. When people first came out here, they tried to mine that for coal. 
<laughs> and uh, guess what? Obsidian doesn't burn. So they really, really couldn't use it as a heat source. But it's sandwiching, you can see on either side of that obsidian, that uh, how it baked the rest of the units in these, in these tufts that, that's, that has it. And then if you go to the next slide. Okay, we'll start your animation here. Yeah. This is, again, the Shoshone Volcanics. Um, this I created with a drone in about half an hour out in the field of flying. Um, they're going to put a road sign up by that obsidian seam for Benny's road cut. And this image and a link so that you can download it to your phone to have it is going to be included also. I'm working on Daryl Collin with that. But uh, you can see that it's the detail you can get off of these off of photogrammetry is spectacular. Let's go on to the next slide, Linda. Oops. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, what? Gersling? Did we Gersling? There we go. Yeah. This is a Gersling mine area. This is one of my work sites. The person you see on the left is my field assistant, John. He is not a geologist, but he has spare time and um, comes out with me. And his daughter is the person picking up in the next one. She has come out and been my field assistant for four years now. And she is just starting this month at UNLV in environmental science. And her sister is also starting and she's going into um, planetary science. So I, I feel real honored to be inspiring the next generation of geologists. Next slide. And here's some of the local structures. You got all your basic um, forms. You got dune forms. You got ripple marks on the right. In the middle though, because it's so hyper arid, these faults, this, all the slicken lines are really, you can't really see it really well, but it's beautiful striations through this. It's so diagnostic and it's so incredible to see. Next slide. So this is a GIS I made of Gersley. Um, just a couple different views of it. Uh, this is gonna be published. It, part of it was published in 2014. The rest of it will be published with my thesis. Next slide. This animation, Again, I created, I got a GSA grant. I got $1,775. I found a pilot. We flew for two days over the No Paws and the Resting Spring Range, which are on both sides of the Chicago Valley where I work. And I processed these images into 3D images that I will lay that GIS work um, that you saw on the previous slide on top of this for a true 3D representation of the map. And, um, let me tell you, it's the resolution is spectacular. You've got basically the Precambrian um, all the way up through the Cambrian um, in this area, and um, the resolution on it is so good. You can zoom in and you could do stratigraphy bed by bed. I got the, that the resolution got to be that. So have you that. been able to hike when you were taking your photos? Are you like up here on the edge looking down or what? No, I was flying for this one. I was oh, in for flying for this one. Okay. I was hanging out the window of a, of a, a Piper Cub. <laughs> um, and this, this gap that you see. Oh, Oops, I'll go back. Okay. Yeah. You mean the gap anyway, like right there? No, no. There's a gap in, in, um, in the back. You can see it as it spins around. That's where I was flying the drone because um, sometimes you don't get good coverage when you're flying. There's a valley you didn't get, you know, see all the bottom of. So that's what I'm using the drone for. I've got this giant aerial picture set, and I'm using the drone to patch the holes. Next slide, please. The Chicago Pass has been a labor of love. I started this in 2000, and it was an extraordinarily complicated geology area. You can take a look at the map. The faults are in red. Um, and it's got a package that starts in the Cambrian and goes all the way up to um, the Pennsylvanian, Permian Pennsylvanian Bird Spring Unit. Uh, it, the map that was done in 1963 for Don Wilhelm's thesis has been used by many, many people as a piercing point for reconstruction of the ranges using the thrust faults. And Dr. Pavlis and I, over the past 20 years, have been refining and remodeling that set um, I have some information on this. If you want some more information, I can get that to you. Next slide. This is the Chicago Pass, the purple you see spinning around. That's um, the Cambrian, Precambrian. In fact, the Cambrian, Precambrian boundary is there. This is about 
maybe 16, 18 kilometers worth of the mountain range um, that I've made into a 3D model. And if you, if you go to what well, well, it's been around, because it really is a pretty model. Um, when you go to the next slide, you'll see the next step in this process, which is I created a digital elevation model based off of that 3D thing. And this is what I'm going to drape the line work for all of the faults and stuff over. And you can see these white dots. Those were the camera positions as we were flying around. Um, next slide. And I am constantly amazed. Every once in a while, you just walk across a flower in the middle of nowhere. There's a little bit of beauty and a little bit of life just peeking out you know, through Death Valley. I, it leaves me constantly amazed. And this is three geologists looking to the future. <laughs> All right. Well, we're apparently it's slightly to the east. And then this segues into Megan stuff. This is a picture just real quick. That's um, Badwater Basin from the view of Dante's view. I don't know if you have one of those pictures, but it's it's 5,650 feet. 5,460 feet? Yeah, it, it's, it's decently, yeah. I think it's halfway up through telescope. Telescope's about double that. Yeah, it's like a mile above Badwater. You can see the salt pan of Badwater in the background. And thank you, that concludes my portion well, of this. We'll, we'll get back to you. Don't go anywhere. We're just no, going no. to run some video here because uh, okay. Charles is the star. So, <laughs> And then Megan, it was, you know, at the park ranger and also a visitor down. So Badwater Basin, remember in that opening uh, Google Earth thing that I showed you, you know, how flat it is out there. This is a park service stop that everybody goes to, the Badwater Basin, and it is below sea level. Mm -hmm. And this little Google Earth here will show us the road. And uh, here's where the, the park service stop is. So you just drive down this road. And you get to Badwater Basin. And, of course, what Charles and I are always excited about is we studied evaporites. And so when you get to touch an evaporite, we just get all excited. It's unreasonable. And uh, we have some good video of what it's like to be out in the, in the basin. And then uh, we'll have some more information about some of these hills that you see on the side as well. So, yeah, I just... And Jim, you know, you can comment here, but just so the audience knows that from just from the reading that Jim gave me some references that it's a, a big grob in here in the and that's what we're looking at with the evaporates is a big grob. In. And Jim, do you agree with the fault pattern here or is this too schematic? Um, <laughs> it's it's more cartoonish than anything, but I, I don't disagree with it. How about that? <laughs> All right. And on where we go to the Bad Water Basin, which is extremely photogenic. So this morning we got up with the sun and we left Furnace Creek and we're driving along the boundary of Death Valley and the eastern side. And uh, we're right now at 282 feet below sea level. We're following the Death Valley fault zone. The road pretty much on the west side follows it as well so there is a major pull apart graben and there's strike slip and the basin is subsiding over the last couple million years this is the lowest point so this is where there's some active evaporates behind us <laughs> and we're going to go walk out and see the salt pan Ah, here we are, digging up the evaporites. Uh, we're going to come up to a, a, a segment in here. Or this uh, Death Valley Basin is about 9,000 square miles of drainage, but we're having a hard time finding what used to be a lake here. Uh, all that remains are these evaporite crests, and if you dig down into them a little bit, you can get very hypersaline water that's in the act of going from supersaturated liquid to uh, halite crystals and when the crystals form they expand and so we're going to be looking for mud cracks and a lot of the uh, types of uh, evaporitic textures here and uh, 
Right now, it's only about 75 degrees. It's still in the morning, and we're glad we're here on a day where the temperature is not too hot. Are we going to look for any crystals, like gypsum crystals? Or? Yeah, so when we went to other places like uh, Jet, Oklahoma, and we dug into the uh, evaporites, we were able to turn up selenite crystals. So we'll have to look around and see what's uh, under the surface here. Okay, so this uh, I'm cutting in a, vi a video that Megan gave me. Megan, do you want to comment on your on what you're doing here? Sure. So me and a friend had gone back out to Death Valley. Um, he was park ranger there at the time as well. And Badwater was one of our major places of study. And as a hydrogeologist, I knew the water table was right there. And actually during this time, it was right after a large rainstorm. And so most of Badwater was liquid. And that leads to some wildflowers down the, down the road. And that's a pretty a special thing. But this will show just how shallow the water is. Wow. Well, I don't think we, when we were there, we didn't have a, I mean, we just saw this kind of stuff on there. Uh, we didn't have a shovel like you did to dig beneath it. Oh, no, that was just our hands. Oh. We just, uh, we went in because we were determined to find water. <laughs> well, we like crystals and we'd take them with us if they were uh, not, not too, we didn't want to put them in a bag and take them with I really them. wonder why. Did somebody dig these holes? <laughs> here looking at the the actual salt here. That's an actual salt. I don't know that it'd be food quality, but you can see a little bit of liquid down here. There's a little bit of water in the salt pan. And, and this is in the morning. We were there in April in the morning. And I think... Let's see. Oh, okay, now here we, here we go. We're in the depth of Death Valley. And we've got red evaporitic rock and salt crust right here. Kind of reminds me of our friends in the Michigan Basin. Oh, yep, definitely salty, and um, you can sure use it out here, because you sweat a lot. We're drinking a lot of water, and it's great to be in one of these incredible evaporite basins, and the fact that this was covered as a lake by, uh, in the recent past, and now it's all evaporite, it just shows that uh, these inter-mountain inter basins can uh, dry up and uh, freshen up and uh, in geologic time leave a lot of different uh, things in the record but today it's salty okay well well I'm gonna introduce Megan here I got a chance to meet her before the show and she worked at the Park Service at Furnace Creek in 2012 and she gave me some of these pictures but we're gonna switch to a small a short PowerPoint she wants to talk about the groundwater and other aspect so let me get close. all right well just a real quick thing about me just some some of my history is I started off doing structural geology and, and offshore geology and it brought me to Death Valley I'm actually from Bakersfield and so it was just a <laughs> I know thank you so it was a full circle for me so actually the photo you see on your right hand side that's leaving um, kind of the Furnace Creek area it was one of my favorite places to sit when I was there we had Lots of eclipses, and the park rangers would make that area. They bring out telescopes and stuff like that. So it was a very interactive place because people do live in Death Valley. Um, believe it or not, we have the Shoshone tribe right next to Furnace Creek. And then we have the park service personnel that lives right down the street. And so between Furnace Creek and where the park service is, we have artist palettes. So when you're coming in, you're, you're going to be taking a lot of fun curves through different formations. And when you get to to the Furnace Creek area and the Artist Palette area, that's really where a lot of my research came into. So because this is the more um, area where people live, that's where a lot of the springs flow into. And one of the biggest spring in that area is actually called Texas Spring. And so that was something that I monitored. And so when it comes to Artist Palette, what we would do is we considered that as part of Badwater as well. 
So when you're looking at bad water, you can look up at artist palette. And coming from Texas in Galveston, where I'm at sea level, and I'm looking up a football field to see where I work at, it's very surreal to see that whole difference in the fact that you were standing once in water, and now you have these, like you said, active evaporites. Like, they are different from every day. When you're walking, I don't know if anyone heard y'all walking, but it sounds like snow. And it is one of the coolest experiences that you could possibly have because it even looks like it sometimes. And so Artist Palette is one of my favorite things. They have special sunrise and sunset drives that you could do. And that was something that the rangers like to put on. And so you could take these, these tours to go up there and you're going through all these different colors. And what it is is the oxidation based on which type of rock that is. Um, a lot of it's iron-based. Um, we have some basalts and all of that that go into there. And we got some micas to give that beautiful, I love mica when it gives that little shine to it. And when you're walking in artist palette, it is very soft, actually. So all of these rocks are just small, maybe a centimeter or two. And so it's, it's almost like a sand. It's very fine. And it's very interesting to see how they keep that formation. And even on the same type of slide, and like the middle photo, you could see where I have like red based iron with the pink and then you have the green and you have purple right next to it all on the same flow and what's interesting as a park service employee is we got to interpret that to be able to explain it to people who aren't like geologists like this so another fun project that has to do with artist palette um, as well as bad water is all these fluvial formations Part of my process as well is in the visitor center, the carpet is actually the actual fluvial formations of the topography. So when you walk into that, I was able to map and get a, an aerial view and they put that together and we made a new like visitor center. And so um, with the artist palette, with all of those different types of rocks, what's interesting too is you can... Most people don't go off the beaten path, but geologists, you know, we take our risk, right? And they have these special roads that are called, like, um, just blanked. It is desert pavement, and it is these rocks that have been heat down for so long and compacted to where we could be able to go into different places within the park service. And so Artist Drive is a full circle, and it goes around Devil's Golf Course, which is just another formation, another fun thing that they have in the area right behind all of Furnace Creek. Um, so you can go to the next slide on that one. Okay. And this one, this is kind of fun because we do, the Park Service actually has resource management. So that's where the geologist, Oops, hydrologist. Let me go back, oh, no, back, back. I was trying to get rid of the top menu. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. So we have um, a little area. We have biology, um, we have archaeology, and then my group was resource management. We were mining, hydrology, and GIS. And so what we do is we all actually work together. So the mining personnel are actually the Bureau of Land Management. So because of all of the abandoned mines from the early you know, 1900s when it was actually called Green Valley Ranch because people actually didn't like for it to be called Death Valley or <laughs> Furnace Creek. It was off-putting. And so in order to get more people in, they changed it to Green Valley Ranch. And actually that was something I learned um, with archaeology. So one project that I did is right near the Oasis Hotel, the, the first large hotel before you get to Furnace Creek, there's the Texas Spring. And one of my projects was doing um, monitoring of the wetlands. And back in the early 70s, 80s, they had created this culvert to divert the water to get to the ranch for like the date farm that they have at Furnace Creek and things like that. And so our job as hydrogeologists at the time were to increase the flow rate and see if it can go back to its natural alluvial formation. So I would take a Trimble GPS and go out and I would walk it and then we'd change the flow on the spring head and then we'd see how much it, it changed. And with that, I had to work very closely with archaeology because it's going through the Shoshone tribe. And all of these culverts were, you know, historical. And for that, I had... It was very interesting. In, in this building right here, this small brown building, you could open it up and it is very sterile. You put on white gloves and it has artifacts going from the 1800s to now. From the letters written about their water issues, from the letters written about landslides, to the borax mining, to people, you know, not, you know, writing home and that type of thing. So I got to take 
all of that into consideration as well when I was able to do all of my groundwater to monitoring. And so we were able to work with the different groups. And another fun, interesting thing that we did back in 2012, it's in the Federal Register. You can look it up. There's a Saline Valley impact, Environmental Impact Statement. So Death Valley has three main valleys that go through it. Start with Death, Panamint, and then Eureka Valley, and then there's Saline. Actually, I like there's four. So um, you get to the top. It's like a nine-hour drive to get all of 20 miles. Um, because you're going through the Inyo National Forest and going through all this, and then you end up in the most beautiful mining area, and there's these random hot springs. And these hot springs were actually built in the 70s to be compounds for people to come out, and what the Park Service was doing is we're like, hey, you know, y'all are kind of taking a bunch of the groundwater out of here, making it, you know, what you need to do for visitors, but... We need it for the people who live here and for the natural springs and stuff. So we were able to go into that, do an impact statement. Um, and so that actually was published um, very recently into the Federal Register on what that ended up doing. So very recently they I, chose. I just want to ask, what does a pupfish look like? Oh, I'll get to that one too. Um, <laughs> so, these, so up here at these hot springs, they actually did not have pupfish up there. However, when you go back down south, so that was another thing I didn't want to get down here to the Devil's Hole. So Death Valley cuts out a little bit into to Nevada, and that's where the Armagosa is. And there's a special place called Devil's Hole. And it is just as scary as it sounds. It is a giant hole. And you walk down about 50 feet very steep on these rocks to get to these pupfish. And part of the job as hydrogeologists is we worked with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and on a quarterly basis, we would actually scuba dive down there and count the fish to see how they were doing in their production and stuff like that, because it was very integral as part of part of Death Valley is we have this endangered species, and an aquatic endangered species on that, not just like the bighorn sheep, or we had an invasive burrow spe species because of all of the mining, so there are burrows all over Death Valley, <laughs> and so that's very interesting, but the, the pupfish it was very integral that we, we monitored their water quality. We monitored the air um, to make sure that no one, like, stepped on them. Because that happens. People would break in, sometimes vandalize and step on So we had to be prepared for that. So it was very secure. Um, and as well as there was a few times where on those fault lines around that area, we'd have an earthquake, and you would be able to see the water flow back wow. and, full and slow. And, that. and it was very very slow and controlled and it's very interesting to see that it would be like a day later that we we were able to see the resultant of the earthquake but it was very cool to see that and so after that would happen we would have to go make sure that the pupfish you know didn't have any issues during that to make sure that they were still going good because they're about yay big they're, they're just like a little beta fish. Um, they're not beautiful. They're desert fish. <laughs> so, but they are a very interesting part of it all. And GIS, we do a lot of, a lot of mapping and stuff. So this too, this is probably one of my favorite photos looking from the salt flats up to the funerals. Um, those mountain ranges were my absolute favorite to drive through. When you, when you're going up north through Death Valley, you'll hit a bunch of different areas. So there's a lot of unique historical and I know one person mentioned Scotty's Castle and Scotty's Castle is a beautiful mansion on the north side of the park and a few years ago there was a really big rainstorm where it flooded out most of Highway 190 and it we weren't able to get to Scotty's Castle anymore and it did take a little bit of it down but the Death Valley Historical Association, along with the park rangers, have been working very diligently to go ahead and get that back up and running. I believe they have. So every summer also they bring in um, museum interns for Death Valley. And they'll be, they actually are the ones who put together all of the data that we have um, in hydrogeology and that as well. And so they put that together for us to go ahead and put into documentation for anyone in the future to go ahead and never need that. Um, so that was a very interesting thing to do, but mapping groundwater wells, there are groundwater wells probably one every mile, and you would probably never know unless you're looking for a little shiny metal thing sticking up out of the ground, but that was something we did on a daily basis as well. And one other fun thing that I really enjoyed was we actually worked hand-in-hand -hand with the National Weather Service. So I had the pleasure of being there in one of the hotter summers in the past decade, and it got up to 135 degrees one day. Wow. 
put this in perspective for everyone. I was walking from my building about 10 feet to the next building over, and I thought I was stung on my face by just bees or horse flies, and it turned out that my jewelry had gotten so hot, it was cauterizing all of my piercings. Oh. And so it's something that <laughs> you don't expect to ever happen when you're just walking to work. Um, and so when we have these rainstorms, and they could be, you know, way across the way on a different mountain range, but that'll slowly flow down. There's only one road in Death Valley. And when that washes out, it washes out. And so it's really interesting because when you're in, in Death Valley, the the name is pretty inclusive as to what you see. It is awe-inspiring and it is it's a very interesting environment and it is dangerous in that. And so being able to learn about the gel, to learn about the areas, to see where you can be safe and see how it affects it. Because when you hear landslides in California, that's normal. It rains, and like L.A., you'll you'll lose a whole mountainside on that. And so to be able to see it without any vegetation, to be able to see it without any people in it, it is incredible to see exactly what, you know, the earth wants to do, how the water wants to flow, how the rocks want to react to it. So it is very interesting to see it because each valley is different. You have sand dunes, it's no worries on that one, and it's something that you can keep talking about this location forever. Um, there's you, the Yubahibi Crater Gym, I don't know if you've been up to that one. Um, I have, the, once, the large yes. yes, and it's and it's beautiful, and you could just look down into these, these volcanic areas, and it's very interesting. You, there's so many different aspects to what's going on in this area. Um, that it is one of the most unique places to visit. Well, I want to get back to this video. I think it's going to dovetail with what you're saying about Artist Point quite well. Uh, we, uh, we did get some more video, and we go into Artist Point, which is quite hilly, as you'll find out. So here we are driving. This is sort of very close to where you had that very nice and highly, highly detailed picture, but we're driving on the highway going... Uh, All the way to the west. I'm thinking, let's go just a little further and take the road that takes you to the center and then the other side and just get a little view coming back. So we are doing an east-west transect across the center of Death Valley. And uh, it's pretty desolate out here. There's a little, I, we're not really seeing any vegetation. And uh, we'd arrange for a tumbleweed to come uh, rolling by if we could find one. So. We got a pretty good breeze going as the uh, day is heating up, the air currents are circulating, and since they're trapped between two mountains, the air currents just circulate and heat up and continue to circulate and heat up, so uh, things have a tendency to get pretty hot here. But we've had a really good morning. We got up early and we saw a lot of things by the morning light, and uh, we've enjoyed the north-south transect, and now we're in the center doing an east-west transect. So. Uh, really getting an appreciation for the size and extent of Death Valley. 9,000 square miles. And our next segment, we're going to go to Zabriskie Point. So I'll just stop here. Uh, both of my co-hosts know Zabriskie Point, and, and we're going to find out that it's actually been a, a famous movie location as well. But these are Miocene age ash flows. Uh, any comments from our, our uh, guest host? Anyone seen Star Wars? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's going to be Right. Right. And I, uh, and the only thing is, in the 60s, there was a movie made called Zabriskie Point that mm -hmm. people did the music for. Terrible music, but great scenery. I mean, not terrible music, terrible movie, but great scenery. <laughs> Right, so oh, Megan told me this, and I and I went and got a clip. You know that the Zabriskie Point and uh, environments around that were the scene of many scenes in the first Star Wars movie. It says here, Luke Skywalker meets Obi Wan Kenobi at Zabriskie Point, and I think the next show is that this is uh, all photographers come up here and everybody gets a great picture. This is about eight in the morning. And these are fairly young ash beds, sort of an upper Miocene to tertiary, perhaps. 
And they have like these unusual banding colors that make great photos. And now we're driving south from Furnace Creek. It just sort of a risky point at sunrise. We're going to bed. Okay, we'll just skip past through this. So what we do is we go into the mountains, and I just want to Roll. show that it's quite so hilly. As we go down, and hopefully we'll pop up on the other side of the dip. <laughs> so uh, everybody gets to play with their car brakes on this. Look at this. Or play with their accelerator. I like to take this relatively quickly. So we're just driving through ash beds. Is that is that what's on here? This is artist palette, and you can see some of the colors, uh, especially the green and pink colors. But uh, yeah, it's real, real spectacular scenery. And uh, they told us that to see this either it, at you know near sunset or in the morning, because then they told me they'll see the colors even better. And I don't know. I think probably any time of day you can probably get some pretty good photos here. So th I think this would make a pretty cool video game. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. I could create the digital elevation model for it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Death Valley Grobin. Well, let's speed up ahead. So, oh, okay, here's, here's some pictures of the actual – I thought this was the most colorful uh, highlighted areas. And so, Jim, like what makes these green colors? Uh, Megan had that in her slide. Um, yes, about... some of it's, um, so we have, I believe it was the basalts are making it green. I cannot remember, but we have iron rich, which makes the purple and the red. And then we have the micas that give you the, pur the purple as well and give it some of that sheen that'll give it that, that different color. But it's all because of oxidation. That's why. Cool. It's like being on another planet. It really is. It, it, it is otherworldly, so it is a popular place for, for movie sets. Being in California, I'm sure they come out here to shoot. It reminds me of these old Star Trek shows where they were always fighting you know, the aliens in uh, Star Trek, and maybe they came out here or, or another place in California. And so just finishing this up here, we're on, almost done with our road trip. We're a little uh, getting close to noon. So I think, Diana, why don't we go right to questions? Diana, have we got any questions from the from the group? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the questions was uh, from Janelle, and she said, asks, are there any rare earth deposits? Oh, uh, we're just, Linda and I were just talking about this. Um, for the most part, mining has been shut down in Death Valley. There's a couple of legacy mines. Like, I think Ryan is still a mining district, um, which is out by uh, Zabriskie Point. Uh, but there's been, um, on the other side of the Panamints, towards Owens Valley, there has been um, rare earth elements found. And they're trying now to open up an REE mine, but um, they're getting a lot of... Um, like blowback from the community because it's strip mining and nobody really wants to do that to the topography, but there are rare earth elements out there and they are of great interest. Any more questions? Uh, no, there's, there's just been a few uh, comments, uh, awesome images, great tips for the, um, for those wanting to go out. Um, let's see. Uh, really appreciate you sharing the videos, Linda. Great. Um, I've asked anyone if they have questions to go ahead and type them into the group chat. Okay. Does anyone want to comment about borax and the 20, what is it, 20 mule 20 team mule borax? Team. Yeah, the uh, mule team. So that, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's near the sand dunes. You could actually still see when you're looking from the sand dunes towards the mountains, towards Badwater, you could still see 
their paths that they took with the mules to, to mine that borax to get it down. And actually, I love it still. You could still buy Death Valley Borax at the store. And it's still called, yeah, like, yeah. Mule Team, and you can get it. And that's, like, my favorite thing to see because it's, it just has that feeling of old Western. And some of Jim's photos, too, and this is just jumping a little around that, um, with all of the old cars, it is like you are taking a trip back in time. And I know, Linda, you didn't really get to speak on the on the ghost towns, but they, well, we're, we're gonna, they are I, I want to show this here because this is a Charles in action. We now realize this was Miocene age. But uh, when we drove up here... We so here we are on the road to Keene Mine. We're heading towards the Funeral Mountains. We're still down on the valley floor. We're pretty low below sea level, at least 200 and something feet. And we're looking at some sedimentary deposits that are isolated out in the middle of the basin, clearly some type of basin fill, and they're highly uh, bedded, uh, looks like sandstones and shells, and they're little things that are dissolved out. So uh, pretty interesting, and they're deformed. So far, the temperature is not too bad. It was about 80 at the visitor center just a few minutes ago, and uh, it's going to be heating up. We're here still in the morning, so uh, we're out to explore the mine and to go take a look towards uh, the Funeral Mountains as we drive up and take a look. Our ultimate goal this morning is to get to Rhyolite. So I'm, I'm always very interested in this. Uh, these are, this is an image of all the gold mine claims that are around the Keene Wonder Mine, which is just up the road from where Charles was. But as Jim reminded me that you can't, uh, it's a national park now. I'm like, darn, you know, go check this out. So I was uh, fascinated by the Keene Wonder Mine, and here it is. Ooh, it's all abandoned now, but it's a, a place you can go. And they uh, found uh, about a million dollars worth of gold in veins. It's not a place for deposit. It's a, ve it's a vein deposit. And so, again, extremely desolate out here. I mean, this could be Mars. If you want to do a, a movie where people are walking around on Mars, uh, this would be your place to go. And then this was about uh, how they would wash the mine out of the host rock. And so what's, Jim, do you know what the host rock, is it the rhyolite, the host rock for the gold? I do not know. That's, that was what I figured. Uh, you know, they have a, rhyolite is a, is a fine grain version of granite. And uh, I think they call the town rhyolite. We'll go see that. And I believe all these uh, Miocene age rocks are like igneous or they're this, uh, the, they're a version of fine grain granite. And so there's a lot of lore the, around the Keen Mountain, uh, Keen Mountain Wonder, the Keen Wonder Mine. There they called it the Bullfrog Claim. And there's a lot of as interesting uh, historical things that you can find online and in museums around the area. And so this is uh, another photo of their mining uh, operation. And we're going to go quick and go visit the only town I've ever heard of named after a mineral. If anybody in the audience can think of another town named after a mineral, uh, this is the town of Rhyolite. And it's it was uh, started in the late 1800s. Jasper. What? Oh, Jasper. Jasper. Oh, that's a good one. Sure. So uh, a lot of, the, a lot the of town, you know, has these Johnny. old buildings, but... It actually uh, was a very big town around 1904, and here's 1906, some of the ruined tops. And, of course, this has been a movie set as well, you know, for TV shows. And so when the gold mine ran out around 1906 or 7, uh, people abandoned the town, and everything fell down in disrepair. So uh, there are some photos in a local museum that shows it reconstruction. This was the jewelry store. So when the mine was super active, there were 10,000 people here living in Rhyolite. And this was a bank. So there's the Rhyolite bank from an image and what's left of it. Nice. Well, this is the old train station. And since we're a little short on time, let's go back to the chat. Is there anybody else that has any questions? So there were a few questions about um, visiting the, the area. One question was, what is the best time to go? And then someone else said, um, if you had three days, would someone be able to summarize a good itinerary? Uh, the funny thing, let me, let me field this one. Uh, I wrote 
I, I gave Charles and Linda in 2018 um, an itinerary about Death Valley because Charles told me they were going on this trip. So I listed a few sites for them to see. And I have that file still. I would be more than happy to provide that to anyone who wants it. Yeah, that's good, Jim, because I can't give you three days. I'd have to give someone at least a week <laughs> to, to get some good stuff. Well, I agree. It's, it's hard to sum this all up in one hour. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm glad we went long. And people are sticking with us. You know, we still have everybody online, so nobody's uh, hungry today. Why don't we just keep going? I'm, you know, it's, if we got some good things. I know that when we when we crossed in, there's uh, limited roads. So that limits um, some of the time that you have to spend. And this is one of the major roads here. So I think on one day we went uh, we went down to Badwater and we saw Zabriskie Point all in one morning and then went back because it was getting hot. On another day, that's where we went up to uh, Rhyolite and the Keene Mountain Line where you have to actually cross into Nevada. And we also saw the sand dunes, which is really scenic as well in stovepipe wells, and that's doable. But what's really hard is to get up in this area. Urba Hebe yeah. Crater, that's almost a whole day <laughs> trip in itself. Uh, it's a three and a half hour drive from Shoshone. It's a long drive it, from that. Hey, it Linda. Is dirt roads. <laughs> yep. So there is, um, the, the, the favorite things to do is the Badwater Basin and to do an east-west transect and do north-south, as Linda said. What we wished we could have done if we had one more day. Remember, Jim, you were telling us about those wind ventifacts. What are those boulders that kind of move? The racetrack. I'm oh, sorry. The racetrack. Yes. Yeah. Where's yeah. that? And tell us about that, please. It's, um, it's up in the kind of northern part past Ubi Hebe. You got to go down. You can see where it says racetrack fly out underneath the A from Beth Valley. Oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's the road is atrocious. You need to have a you need to have a four-wheel drive vehicle. Do not do, and it's got to be lifted off the ground. Do not try it in a like a like a Volkswagen Golf or something. It just you can't do it. But it's I've been, because of that. I've never been there. That's one place I have never been. Oh, it is so, beautiful. So I to do if I could real quickly, um, since well, other wait a minute, let's let Megan. Megan was making a comment. Megan, but, go ahead. Sure. Well, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So I've actually been to the racetrack. And it is incredible because you will see these boulders. I mean, they are boulders that you see where they have started and you're, you see these mud cracks and everything around it. And that's kind of gives it that racetrack look. And so from the, the pressure of like the wind, the, the amount of wind storms and dust storms are just inexplainable in what they are, but over, thousands of years it is slowly push it and it creates this little grate behind it so like if you were speeding in the car and you shut it down that's what it looks like and over time it just pushes it through and some of the most beautiful views especially in that area and especially the whole park um the park is like a twilight area there's no light pollution whatsoever and so you can see the galaxies behind it and it's beautiful to be able to see this bright rock because it's it, the, the ground is so white because of the, the salt and everything that is evaporated from there. It has this reflection at night, and it is incredible to be able to see that. But Jim is right. It took me a whole day to get there and back, and that was the only thing I did. It's like magical. So the photos we've seen in National Geographic are these boulders out in the middle of mud-cracked area with long linear traces so you can see their paths but how did they move and how did they get to where they are and why did they continue to move? Kind of it's uh, one of those um, I was going to go mysteries. look for a photo, but I don't want to interrupt the, the thing. So well, one, well, one, can que I ask one the question was for the best photos, I mean, do you have uh, any particular recommendation for people that want to take beautiful f uh, photographs? For what For places to go? Anywhere in Death Valley. Anywhere. It's beautiful. Even the stuff that shouldn't be beautiful is beautiful in Death Valley. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to show um, if we if people are still hanging in there, um, if we went yeah. farther beyond Linda. Yeah, let's go to, you, let's go to the end. Uh, you, had, you, you reminded me that you have some additional. Here's Exploring Minds. Yeah, here's some Exploring Minds. This is 
The top picture is a Baxter mine up in the Chicago Valley. That light is one of our party coming through. Um, below, that's on the other side of the Noonday Mine out by Tacopa. It's the old uh, spur that hooked up with the Tonopah and Tidewater Railway. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, this is, believe it or not, um, there's farming out here. This is a farm that myself and my roommate volunteer at Desert Bloom Echo Farm. It's an organic farm. Um, it's out in Charleston View, which is just outside of Tacopa. Um, and then next slide. These are just pictures from inside that. It's so amazing that in the middle of the most inhospitable climate with the worst soil that this can be done. Next slide. And there's a before and after of weeding some of the beds. Next slide. These were, I wanted everybody to see this. I was out for, Megan, were you out for the 100 year bloom in 2005? I wasn't out there for that one, but we had a smaller secondary one in 2012. These are pictures that I took just in my work area. Um, these seeds lie dormant until enough, until enough rain pushes up over to Sierra Nevada rain shadow. And uh, it's incredible. These, these, even the plants look like they come from a different planet. Like the purple one on the top um, right. Wait, whoops, let me Peter back. Canyon, we can go beyond, go out, beyond, go. Um, Next slide, next slide, next one. Here's what I wanted to show some people like structure and tectonics. This is not in Death Valley Park. So the rocks are not what we call leverites. We got a lever right there because uh, you can't take them out of the park. This is a pencil shale formation um, that as far as I know, only three people know where it is. It's beautiful and it's, the, the colors are not well represented. Next slide. That's more of the pencil shale broken off into this odd pear shape. I'm sorry. Next slide. I keep trying to get rid of the Next. top menu and it, it advances. Go ahead. What is this again? It's more of the pencil shale, but it broke into this weird pear shape that I've never seen before. So next slide. This is great. You can see it actually bends and goes straight up and down. It's a 90 degree bend in the uh, shales there. Um, incredible. And then the next slide. And then this is typically what we see out in my work area. So it's it's just, if anyone wants information on this, wants places to go, I know where you can get fossils that you can take back because it's outside the park. I know where you can see structures like this. I'll be more than happy to help anybody. And we'll send everybody uh, our, our guest host emails uh, so they can correspond. Well, I think we, we went a little longer than we expected. I really want to thank you guys for calling in. Jim's calling in from uh, California or Nevada. No, Nevada. In Nevada. And Megan's down in Galveston, right? And uh, yes, we're here out in Katy. And I guess Zoom is really a great collaborative uh, product. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. We have another field trip Friday, next Friday. We're going to see the Appalachian Fold and Thrust Belt. Our guest host is going to be Catherine Lee Avery, who is an award-winning geologist who lives uh, in the Morgantown, West Virginia. And she'll come in the call and tell us what we're seeing in that video. So please sign up on the HTS website for next Field Trip Friday on August 14th. And I want to thank everybody and have a great day and a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.